Well, more than 25 years ago, I met Joel and Lynn Rosenberg. It feels like a lifetime ago. Hmm. And then uh, a little more than 20 years ago, uh, Joel and Lynn and my wife Sharon and I, along with a couple of other couples, uh, were in a small group together. And one of the things that occurred in that small group is that we kind of helped all together launch Joel's first book, Hmm. uh, The Last Jihad. And and, uh, we kind of prayed all that through. And who knew? that 20 years later, he would have over 20 books now that you can find on joelrosenberg.com uh, and have five, more than 5 million in print uh, worldwide. Joel is, has many things going on right now. One of the things that he has is the All Israel News and All Arab News. You can find them at allisrael.com and allarab.com. And really, both of these sites are news outlets that report what's happening around the world, specifically in the Middle East, from a Christian perspective, Christian Israelis, Christian Arabs, who really fuel a perspective about what God is doing in the midst of all of that. Joel and his wife Lynn are founders of the Joshua Fund, joshuafund.com, and they have been since 2006 providing education and relief uh, to Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. And they've been, people have invested through the Joshua Fund more than $100 million in that time period to really provide the support that's necessary around that region of the world. Most recently, you can find a book called Enemies and Allies that Joel has written. It's one of his nonfiction books. And in Enemies and Allies, you will see how Joel has had the opportunity, privileged by God, to position him in such a way to be interacting with the likes of Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, El- President El Sisi from uh, Egypt and Muhammad bin Salman from Saudi Arabia and the, what all that is happening in that journey. And so Joel comes to us today from a, with a very unique perspective um, Can I say boots on the ground in the midst of all of what's going on there, considering the war that's taking place now? For for Jesus, it was sandals on the ground, but for us, (laughs) exactly, exactly, exactly. So I've asked Joel to communicate. Today's not going to be kind of like your traditional sermon, unpacking a passage, as much as Joel's going to talk about what God is doing in that region. We see God showing up in the lives of Israelis. We see God showing up in the lives of Palestinians. And Joel has relationships with all of these people. How has a, as a, an American-born Israeli citizen, Jewish believer in Jesus, had the opportunity to connect with people of every variety in that region? But God has opened those doors. And he has some hard things to say to us this morning about some realities that are going on, but that God is at work in the midst of it all, and I've asked him to bring us some good news today uh, amidst all of the bad news that we see day in and day out on our news feeds. So will you welcome for me, please, my good friend, Joel Rosenberg. Well, good morning. Good Palm Sunday morning. Uh, I want to start with the best news. Uh, Just before I came on this six-week trip here to the United States with Lynn to to speak at churches and conf- Christian conferences and on Christian media and uh, secular media uh, and talk about what's happening since October 7th and the, the effect it's having on both Israelis and Palestinians and others in the region. Uh, I, I taped a, my Easter program for our weekly primetime show on TBN, Thursday nights, 9 o'clock Eastern, is the Rosenberg Report. And it's the only... Um, news and analysis show produced in Israel about what's happening in Israel and the region on any American television network ever since the rebirth of prophetic rebirth of Israel back in 1948. And that's why I, I said yes to doing it, even though I told the president of TBN that I have a face for radio and I didn't know if he really wanted me on television literally every week, but whatever. And I, we, so we did the Easter show at the garden tomb, at the empty tomb, of Jesus, and um, and I interviewed uh, the uh, the head of the Israeli Bible Society, uh, and, and try to unpack the meaning of Easter right at the empty tomb. And I want to report to you the first point this, this morning is that I was inside the tomb, and it's still empty, and Jesus is still reigning on the throne. And so that's a good thing for us to celebrate uh, this morning because there's going to be some other hard things we got to talk about. But uh, but Jesus has risen. Yeah, exactly. It's a little rusty, but by next week, you're going to be on top of this thing. (laughs) Jesus is risen. 
Amen. Preach it, brothers and sisters. So, let, uh, uh, good. So let's begin. Um, uh, it, Acts 14 is the, a little bit of context for what uh, Jim has asked me to share. And again, it is uh, wonderful to be back on American soil, back in our home church that uh, sent us out. Um, and uh, we're dual U.S. Israeli citizens. We're not missionaries. We're, we're, we're dual citizens of Israel and the United States. Uh, we didn't have to renounce our American citizenship. But when you're a dual citizen, it means you get to vote twice. And so that's like living in Chicago. And so, uh, oh, we have people from Chicago here, so they know. So uh, anyway, it's really great to be here with you all and, um, and, and to be with Jim and Sharon and, uh, and to report. So uh, just, again, some context. Uh, Acts chapter 14, beginning... I'm going to start actually, I'm going to back up a little bit, verse 21. Paul and his team are coming back. They're they're, they're doing ministry in Europe and in the Middle East, and they're circling back through the churches they planted, and they're coming back to the home church in Antioch, in Syria, um, to share um, some of the things that they've seen and heard. The text tells us after they had preached the gospel in one particular city, and they made many disciples. Then they returned to you know, the other cities that they'd shared the gospel in and planted churches, uh, churches in, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and they were strengthening the souls of the disciples. They were encouraging them to continue in the faith, and they were saying, because Paul needed to be honest with these new believers and these new congregations, this is not going to be easy. Just because you've signed up for life in Jesus and you're going to live forever and ever and ever in heaven and your sins have been forgiven because you have repented and received the crucified and risen Christ, don't expect your life to get easier. It's going to get better, but it's not going to be easier. And in fact, he says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Your life's going to get harder. And that has certainly been the case in Israel. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with them with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom these new young believers had, had believed. And they, then Paul and his team, they pass through Pisidia, they come to Pamphylia, they, they preach the word in Perga, they go down to Italia, this is now in Turkey, they're, they're coming back from Europe into the Middle East. From there, they sail, they sail to Antioch in Syria, uh, modern-day Syria, from which they had been commended by, uh, to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. And I love this passage. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they spent a long time with the disciples. Unfortunately, Lynn and I are not going to be able to uh, spend a long time with you all, but we're honored to be here and to give you a report from the front lines. This has been Israelis and Palestinians' darkest hour. Certainly since uh, 1948, uh, when Israel was reborn. Israel, of course, calls May 14th, 1948, Independence Day. And on the the, uh, Western calendar, we're coming up on the 76th anniversary of the modern uh, state of Israel, Independence Day. Arabs, however, Palestinians, do not celebrate that day uh, or that period. They they describe it as al-Nakba which is the disaster or the catastrophe. And uh, this is, the, this is the, the world that our two, uh, our, our, us and our neighbors are, are facing. And we are in another catastrophe. And um, I'm going to walk you through uh, some context uh, because you, you need to hear a little, bit, a little bit of the bad news before you understand the good news of what God is doing. I want to begin by saying God did not send 3,000 terrorists into Israel on on Saturday, October 7th. That was Satan. Satan comes to rob, kill, and destroy. That's what Jesus helps us understand, that he's a thief. And he's coming to rob us, kill us, and destroy us. And this is what he explains in John 10.10. Jesus explains who Satan is, and then he explains that he's the exact opposite. That Jesus came... that we might have life, eternal and abundant, here and forever. And so in that passage, you see the the heart of anti-Semitism. You understand, uh, I mean, you don't see it immediately, but let me just take a moment. John 10.10, right? Satan comes to rob, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes to bring life. They're the exact opposite. They have the exact opposite mission. Okay? Now, they're not equal. Jesus is God. He's the creator. 
of heaven and earth. He's our creator and our redeemer if we let him be that. Satan is not a creator. He's certainly not God and he's not equal, but he is opposite. Okay. Now, when you understand that, now you understand that everything God is for in the scriptures, Satan is against and is actively working to rob, kill, and destroy, right? So in Genesis 12, when God lays out the Abrahamic covenant and he says to Abraham and later repeats it to Isaac and then repeats it to Jacob and it continues on through the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, he says, I'm, I'm going to choose you to bless you. So Satan says, fine, I'll choose you, Israel, Jewish people, to curse you. God says, beginning in Genesis 12 and throughout the book of Genesis and throughout the Old Testament, I'm going to give you, Israelite Jews, a land. Satan says, fine, then I'll take it away. God says that I'm going to give, I'm going to give you Jerusalem and I'm going to make it a city of peace. Jerusalem, a city of peace. Satan says, fine, I'll make it a city of bloodshed. God says, I'm going to make the Temple Mount where I sent Abram to think that he was going to sacrifice his son. And for three days as he took Isaac up to that mountain, Abram considered him dead. But on the third day, what happened? There was a resurrection of sorts. Abram was certain that if he killed Isaac, as God told him to do, that God would have to raise him from the dead because this is the son of promise. But God did raise him from the dead, but not, you know, because by not having him have to die. But that was, that's the three-day period that we are about to celebrate and, 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 and think of between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Okay, so all that to say, God said, I'm going to make that spot in the center of Jerusalem, we, we call it the Temple Mount, I'm going to make it holy to my name. Satan says, fine, I'm going to desecrate it. And this is the battle we're in. Satan is trying to rob, kill, and destroy every Jew in Israel because we're part of a covenant promise he's trying to break. At the same time, He's trying to rob, kill, and destroy the lives, fortunes, and futures of the Palestinians themselves. He hates the Palestinians as much as he hates the Jews. And look at what he has wrought. Now you say, well, that's the Israeli army. Well, okay, so, so you need to watch yesterday's conversation. So over two hours, we were unpacked it. And yes, the Israeli army is, but why is the Israeli army there? Because we had an invading force from an organization that has said in its original charter in 1988 and still on television in interviews today, we are going to kill every Jew, we're going to get rid of Israel, and we're going to do it October 7th again and again and again and again until we finish the job. Now, maybe you're not hearing that on CBS Evening News. Maybe you're not hearing that on CNN. Maybe you're not reading that on the front page of the Washington Post or even on page 92. Shock. Right? So this is why I've gone into the world of Christian, evan uh, not just evangelism, but, but, but journalism. Because that's why we created All Israel News, All Arab News, and the Rosenberg Report. To help you see and hear and understand what's actually happening from a source that you can trust. So Palestinians are being devastated. There's 2.2 million Palestinians in Gaza. They don't all work for Hamas. Many of them support Hamas, but they're not... Hamasniks, as it were, uh, but Hamas did this, and Israelis were blindsided by it. Israelis gave up Gaza in 2005. We said, here, take it all. We gave it to the Palestinians. You got beachfront property on the Mediterranean. You got trillions of uh, cubic feet of natural gas right off your border. Go build a Palestinian paradise. We don't want to govern you. We don't want to rule you. We don't want to occupy you. It's yours. That was 2005, 2006 they had elections, they elected a terrorist organization, Hamas, to lead them, and starting in 2007, attacks have come over and over and over again, up to and including right now. Now I want to say this, and this is going to be hard. In the Abrahamic Covenant, when God makes these promises, he says, 
not only am I going to bless you and make you, give you a great name, Abram, and I'm going to give you a land, and I'm going I'm I'm to give you this promise, these set of promises. I'm also going to make you a blessing to the world, not just to your own tribe, not just to Israel, not to the Jews only, but every family on the, or, in the, on the earth will be blessed through you. There's a number of ways that would happen, but one of it is through the, because the Messiah is going to come through your line. But he says, I will bless those who bless you, but those who curse you, I will curse. God loves the Palestinians, and he wants them to know him. And some do. And we need to pray that more will. But if you curse Israel every single day for 76 years, if you, if you elect a genocidal terrorist organization to lead you as your shepherds to curse Israel and build suicide bombing teams to rush into Israel and kill people and then we built a wall so they built tunnels underneath to get through and then we built things to block that then they built rockets to fly over the walls to kill us so we built the iron dome system to intercept and then they said let's just let's just blow up the wall and, and invade And that's what happened on October 7th. If you do that every single day, you're inviting a consequence. I believe we're seeing judgment on Hamas and on a culture of death. That does not mean we are not supposed to love Palestinians. We absolutely are. Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, what was he before he became the greatest apostle in human history? He was a religious fanatic terrorist who hated anyone who loved Jesus and was trying to arrest them, rob them, kill them, and destroy them. Jesus changes people like that. That's the good news. But before he changes them, there are consequences. And when we're seeing the devastation. Now, I'm not saying that every tactical decision the Israeli army has made is wise and just. But you need to understand, people came into our country on a quiet Saturday morning. It was a religious holiday, Simchat Torah. Uh, that means the joy of God giving us the Torah, the first five books of Moses. It's a Saturday morning. It was a quiet morning. It was a, it was a holiday morning. People were asleep in their homes in little communities all along the Gaza border, living in peace. There was a ceasefire already in place between Israel and Hamas. They were starting to wake up. They were starting to feed their children. They were starting to hear the kids play and take the dog out, go for a run. And 3,000 demonically possessed people stormed into the country. And they cut off the heads of our babies They put at least one baby in an oven and cooked it alive. They raped our women. They raped our girls. They shot children in front of their parents. They shot parents in front of their children. They burned whole families alive in their home. If they tried to escape, they shot them dead. But they did take then about 250 Israelis and some foreigners, including Americans, hostage and then took them back to Gaza on the idea that Israel will never invade, there'll never be a price because we're holding 253 of their people. So we can rob and kill and destroy with impunity and we, there, are no, there are no consequences. We've got the upper hand. That's October 7th. We live there. We live in Jerusalem, not on the border, so eight barrages of missiles inbound for Jerusalem that day. We lived most of that day in our bomb shelter. Every home in Israel has a bomb shelter. And uh, the newer ones, the older ones, there's a bomb shelter in the basement of the apartment building, but you might have to run 10 stories down to get to it. This is this is what we live, this is what, what happened. And so that's the bad news. Imagine the trauma, the fear, the anger, the bitterness, the shock, the disorientation. On both sides, waking up to the worst war we've been through since the war of 1948. This is Israel's darkest hour. This is the Palestinians' darkest hour. And it is dark. 
I've never lived through anything as dark as this. Lynn has never lived through anything as dark as this. Um, I've been to Iraq four times during the war to report, to encourage pastors and Christian leaders. Took Jim Sup. We, you know, I said, hey, you want to go to a war zone? Sure. Let's go teach the book of Philippians to Iraqi pastors who, who need to feed their sheep. Let's encourage the shepherds. And he said, sure, I'll do it. Sharon said, sure, you should go. I thought that Sharon and Lynn were a little too quick to encourage us. <laughs> but we've all worked that out internally since then. So it's all good. So I've been to Afghanistan during the war, but I've never seen anything like this. This was demonic and it was brutal. And it's go- it just goes on and on and on. Some dear friends of ours, uh, Israelis, uh, said uh, the wife, who's Lynn's best friend in Israel, beside me, uh, it, it, she said, it's like there's a thick, dark cloud over the entire land and you cannot see the edges. Except that there are more, st- we know there are more storms. It, it's rolling over us, but there are deeper, darker storms behind us. Last night alone, 50 missiles inbound from Hezbollah in the north. The, 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 the attacks by Iran's other proxy in the region, Hezbollah, is getting worse and worse, and it looks like we're going to have to go into a full-scale war in the north unless God does something supernatural. That means that Hezbollah has 150,000 missiles pointed at us, so if we go in, it's, it's possible they could, they could fire 50,000 missiles at us. When Lynn and I moved with our four sons uh, to Israel in 2014, we moved during a month that 4,000 missiles were being fired. There could be 50,000 in the first month. And that would only be a third of their arsenal. So we are in a, a darkness that is as dark as we've ever seen it and, it, and it could get apocalyptically darker still. That's, that's the context. And, and the question is, where is God? And I'm going to share with you. But, but you can imagine the trauma that both societies are going through. And I want to start, I'm going to, I'm going to start by saying, I'm going to start, I'm well into it now, but uh, I don't, I'm not hearing any stories of Palestinians coming to faith in Jesus in Gaza. I'm not saying that's not happening. This is where our prayer is. But I know that there's a thousand Christians left that haven't been able to flee in Gaza, Palestinian Christians. And, and we and other ministries are doing everything we can to support them through the local Palestinian believing network. They don't, they're not going to do well in a war zone to, he, to, to have Joel Rosenberg and the Joshua Fund or anybody else who are Israelis be seen as helping them. But we're tr- trying to mobilize prayer support and financial support and food and everything else as best we can from the background and do what we can to help the Palestinians, them, Christians themselves in the West Bank, help their brothers and sisters in Gaza. I am not hearing of any good news in terms of people coming to Jesus. Could it be happening? I hope it is. But there's such chaos right now in Gaza, I'm not hearing it. But here's a question that we need to pray for. When this war in Gaza is over, and we're close to it being over, and Hamas being defeated, vanquished, then what? I was in Gaza... A month ago, I never imagined as a Joel Rosenberg, as an Israeli, as a Jew, as an American, as a Christian, I never imagined going into Gaza. I always thought if I go into Gaza, I may never come out. But I was invited in by the Israeli Defense Forces as a journalist, one of the first Christian journalists, actually one of the only two Christian journalists ever invited in during this war. And my colleague and I uh, went in to report for All Israel News, um, TBN for the Rosenberg Report, and he works for Christian Broadcasting Network. We went in. Machine gun fire everywhere, explosions everywhere. And then they took us into a newly discovered set of terror tunnels. We went into cages where at least 12 Israeli hostages had been held there, including the youngest hostage, who was nine months old when he was taken hostage, Kafir Bibis. I got to interview his his aunt, Ophir, and she, I mean, you, I, I don't have time to unpack the grief. It's 170 days today, little Kafir Bibis, little red-headed, most adorable child you've ever seen, except for your own. 
they believe he was in that actual cage that I was in. He couldn't celebrate his one-year-old birthday, but, he, it, it, but it passed, and he's about a year and a half now. Imagine, 170 days. You go down in this tunnel, and it is dark, and it is hot, and it is humid, and there, the air is so thin, and the, the, the tunnel is so narrow, it's sickening. It's the epicenter of evil. Until you get to the section that's the lair of the Hamas leadership, and that's where they were running the war from until Israel discovered the tunnel and sent fighters fighting their way in. And those guys escaped through a back tunnel, took the hostages with them. But when you get to their section, oh, man, it's big. It's high ceilings, beautiful tiling, carpets, beds with actual mattresses and bed frames. It's sickening. But what's bizarre and surreal is I got to cover it. I got to pray for those hostages in that cage. I came out with my colleague, and just before we got in the armored personnel carrier to go to leave and go home to freedom, my friend Chris Mitchell from CBN says, you want to take communion? Communion? Yeah, he goes, I brought communion crackers and, and grape juice. You in? I said, I'm in. I, I never didn't even think of it doing this. So we take communion, we bow our heads and we take communion, the Lord's Supper, at the epicenter of evil. And we say, Lord, break the stronghold of Satan. Set the Palestinian people free of this demonic terror force that is strangling them and bringing ruin as far as the eye can see. And, and, and redeem every Palestinian and every Israeli. Open their eyes, open their hearts to know you. Now, is it, so I, I, I think God took Chris and I there to do that. Yes, to report. And yes, you can Google that. And it, uh, I did an hour-long report taking you into that world. And, but, but it's going to take a supernatural act of the king of the universe. Melech HaOlam, we say in Hebrew. The king of the universe needs to break Satan's stronghold because he's killing the Palestinians of God. And uh, the question for me, one of many, one of the questions is when this devastation ends, when the war is over such that it is, will this break the spirit of radical Islamism and, and open people, okay, we've lost. We are on the wrong team. We don't have to love Israel, but we have signed up with the wrong God. He's a false God. We're getting taught by false teachers and they've led us into ruin. Will their hearts be open to Jesus? Will they be ready to make changes like what's going on inside Iran? Where people are abandoning radical Islam and they're seeking Jesus. And I just interviewed a few weeks ago uh, the Billy Graham of Iran. His name is Hormoz Shariat. I can't get into that story right now. But he was a radical Islamist, Shia Muslim in Iran. Grew up there. His wife, an American, converted to Islam to marry him. And they were on the streets of Tehran in 1979 saying, death to America, death to Israel. And uh, then they got radically saved. And now they're beaming the gospel and Bible teaching back into Iran. And there's a massive awakening. Muslims are leaving Islam and they're coming to faith in Jesus Christ because they can see what Islam is doing to them personally and to their country. I hope that's the prayer. And I hope that's what happens in Gaza. But I can't report that that's happening yet. So pray for that. Let's talk what's happening on the Jewish side. So, uh, as part of our reporting, let's see if I let's try this. Okay. So, uh, Israelis are, have been shaken. Now, this is a, uh, one of the most famous and respected American Jewish rabbis who wrote a column, Where Was God on October 7th? That is, the, that is the, the central question going on in Israel and among Jews here in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, Rabbi Shmuley Boteach. And when you go into his uh, uh, column, you're not going to find much hope. Okay? He doesn't conclude with hope. What, he, what, he tell, what he's saying is, is actually pretty painful. 
he, 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 he describes how he wakes up every morning and reads the Israeli newspapers and to try to understand what's happening. And he reads that one or two or three or four, sometimes 14 Israeli soldiers have died in the night. And when you think of Israel being a small country and the United States being a big country, if you sort of make the equivalent to what it would be like emotionally impactful to yourself, your, your eyes, your ears, your heart, if you read the, these numbers, it would be like the equivalent of 400 American soldiers dying in one evening. He says, I get sick to my stomach. My day is ruined, and then I have to go pray. He says, but why? Why am I praying? He writes in this column. Does a God who watches so much Jewish suffering for so many millennia and does nothing deserve to be praised? Does he deserve to be prayed to? Does he deserve our thanks for what? That's one of the most influential Orthodox Jewish rabbis in the United States. And I can't tell you, you should read the article. It doesn't go, well, but actually, it's all good because. No, he doesn't go there. He doesn't know what to think. And he's not alone. I was having, uh, one of my sons and I uh, was having uh, lunch uh, uh, last, a couple months ago with an Orthodox Jewish prominent person in Israel. And uh, he, he said, I'm so angry. I am so bitter. I cannot pray. I'm not sure if I believe in God anymore. My wife keeps saying, you need to pray, honey. You need... I, he goes, I can't. Why? why? Why would I do that? It's the same, the same conversation. All Israel News has been doing our best to cover the, the, the trend lines as Israelis are struggling this. And, and, and one of the questions is we're seeing, I mean, that's, so that's among religious Jews. Most Israelis are not religious. They don't go into synagogue. They don't read the Bible. They don't pray. The whole country was founded by atheists and agnostics in 1948. Socialists. They weren't communists because communism had not treated Jews well in Europe. So they're like, look, maybe that's wrong. But socialism, absolutely. Atheism, we don't believe in God. So let's go build a country. Now, ironically, in God's, I don't know, humor, Israel was prophetically reborn. Thousands of years of prophecies that Israel would be literally reborn and Jews would literally return to the land and literally make the deserts bloom and literally rebuild the ancient ruins. All the beginnings of the fulfillment of those prophecies started by people who didn't even believe that there's a God, much less that the Bible is true. That's ironic. <laughs> uh, but God doesn't need us to believe in him for him to still be moving in history. But even secular Israelis are starting to think, I mean, you got, so you got religious Jews thinking maybe there isn't a God. And you got secular people thinking maybe there is a God and maybe I need him. That's an interesting dynamic. Um, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency put out a, an article recently called A Leading Religious Zionist Rabbi Says Israelis Have Reconnected with Judaism After October 7th, and he hopes it will stick. Just a few quotes uh, from that article. So there, there are, there, so there are cross currents going on in Israel. Some of them are positive and some of them not so much. But this rabbi says... He's describing that the last month or so, as he's writing it, has created a, a significant crisis of faith, not just in terms of God, but in terms of the government. The government's job in Israel is to protect us from an invasion on our southern border. Now, I know that it's not an issue for you all here in the States. You have no issues on your southern border. And I'm not trying to even be political. I'm just saying, don't worry. You've got nothing to fear. You can let anybody in and they won't kill you. I do have a novel about that. That's the recent one, the Libyan diversion. But anyway, that bad things do happen when people sneak in. But that's a different story. What he's saying is we are having, faith, we're having a crisis of faith in our government because they were supposed to help us and protect us, and they didn't. And people are even questioning, what does it mean to be a Jew? And uh, then he says, let me, he describes some things. He talks about worry. When I speak to my family, our family, Every family is worried about its kids. Now you think, well, of course, we're all worried about kids. No, he's talking about kids who go to the army. 400,000 Israelis have been called up and are serving on the front lines. On every, we're being hit from seven directions. We're at war by, because we're under attack from Gaza in the south. Hezbollah in the north. Syria uh, from Houthi, Iranian-backed Houthi rebels Terrorists in Yemen are firing missiles that go 2,000 kilometers to hit us. We're fighting them. We're fighting the media that hates us and has bias against us. 
We're, fa- we're fighting the UN, who everybody, almost every country is trying to condemn us and boycott us. And I don't know what, and then, oh, and then when we're facing geno- charges that were committing genocide at the world court. I think that's seven or eight. Anyway, you can, you can do the math. So we're all worried, but we're worried about our kids. Two of our four sons have served in the Israeli army, one in a special forces unit, uh, but currently they're not called up, so they're serving uh, in the humanitarian relief work of the Joshua Fund every day, as is one of our daughters-in-law. Then he says, uh, the situation, the crisis is so great that even if God willing we win, mostly he was focused on Gaza, nobody knows how this war is going to end. No one knows what will happen in the north with Hezbollah, and no one knows what will happen with the Palestinians, and no one knows what the state, how the state of Israel will manage the issue of Gaza. The darkness is just off the charts. Then he, he goes on, he talks about the economic worry. Our GDP is down 20%. There's nobody in the airports. There's no tourists. Um, companies are shutting down. People are being laid off. Then he says the third problem is a, is a general feeling of a lack of trust in the government. He referenced that earlier, and the state's institutions. But then he goes into one more thing. He does say the good news is People are coming together as a country. They're volunteering. They're serving. They're, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strong national spirit to, you know, we're, we've come together despite our political divisions to, to, to deal with our enemies. But he says, and, he's, and he says, synagogues are filling with people who are trying to figure out their way back to God. Many sign, uh, synagogues are, 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 people are praying again. And he says, there's a lot of people waking up to prayer because... We understand that we need salvation. Amen. So you got people that are turning against God, and you got people that are saying, maybe I need God. The Jerusalem Post put out a, a, a poll uh, in February. Uh, I'm not going to unpack it at all, but I'm just going to say that 59% of Israelis said October 7th had no influence on their spiritual or religious life at all. It doesn't, doesn't even matter. That's not good. That's bad news. 8% of Israelis say October 7th weakened their faith. And as I've given you some examples, people are, you know, that, that group is thinking maybe I give up with, on God entirely. Also bad news. A third of the country is saying maybe I need more of God. Maybe I need to find God. Maybe I need to press in. And, and so that is encouraging. But, what I'm, so, but overall, I'm saying that the country is being shaken. And that is a prophecy. Amos, you probably haven't spent much time in the book of Amos, but if you, you should. Uh, uh, Amos is talking about uh, uh, judgments of Israel in the past. But he, he, Amos 9.9, 9, God says through the prophet, in the future days, in the last days, and I believe we are in them, God says, I will shake the whole house of Israel among the nations. I believe we're seeing judgment in Gaza I believe we're seeing a shaking in Israel. And it's not that we don't deserve judgment too, but right now we're not in that phase of judgment. We're in a phase of God's letting Satan shake us. He, but God is sovereignly letting it happen. And some secular Israelis are saying they're trying to find their way to God. Some are saying they're trying to pray. They're trying to start a, a conversation with God. And others are saying they're starting to try to read the Bible, particularly the Psalms. And uh, that's good. Now, I'm going to accelerate here. Um, uh, One of the things that we also find good is that as people are so angry about the mainstream media and the fact that it's hard to trust the mainstream media to get news about what's really happening in Israel, Uh, certainly from a biblical worldview, all Israel news and all Arab news, we're seeing a skyrocketing surge of interest uh, in Christians all around the world who are just discovering, hey, there actually is only one set of sites run by Israeli evangelicals and Messianic Jews, both Jews and Arabs, for the rest of the evangelical community worldwide to understand what's happening. It's not a missionary site. It's not a ministry site per se, except that it's, the ministry is help people understand what's actually happening, why it matters, and how it impacts uh, the, the church. We're seeing enormous interest. So that's, that's encouraging, and I hope it's helpful for you. You can sign up for a free email, and every morning you're, you'll get an email to your inbox with all the headlines. Uh, I hope that's helpful. You can find it at allisrael.com. Now, let me give you some, some specifics now, 
And we're going to go just a, a tad long. But um, you can say that from up here because I don't see Jim back there yet. But anyway, and there's no trap door. I, you know, I noticed the baptismal's over there. So as far as I can tell, anyway, so let me give you some examples uh, of, of what I'm seeing, what Lynn and I are seeing. So this is an interesting example. Um, so as part of my reporting, I get to meet people who are on the front lines. In this case, I met this family. Um, they, they, they live near the Gaza border. They were traumatized on October 7th. They don't know God. They're not religious, okay? They're not kippah-wearing Orthodox Jews. They don't, no, they don't. They're very classically secular Israelis. But what happened on October 7th? What happened is Hamas not only started killing everybody in their neighborhood, they took over the house of the parents, the, the older couple. And they held them hostage for 19 hours. Now the son, who's sitting there with them, the, the son is who I interviewed, in the house, blood-soaked floors, bullets, bullet holes everywhere, the good news is they lived. The great news was that at about three in the morning, Israeli commandos burst in from every upstore window, killed all the terrorists, and rescued the parents without a scratch on them. But before that, when they were trying to negotiate their way out, one of the hostages held the mother, uh, with her, his, his uh, arm around her neck, holding a grenade to her ear with the pin pulled. And the son, as a police officer, is at the door, wanting desperately to take the shot, can't do it, because when the terrorist dies, he's going to drop the grenade, and everyone's going to blow up. They were rescued after 19 hours. It's a great story. It's an amazing story. You need to Google it, listen to it. I mean, that's the digital version, but we, you can watch the me interviewing the son in the house. But what's interesting is he says, God came down and saved my parents. This incident has caused the police officer's son, who was sleeping at his girlfriend's house and doesn't know the Lord, not living by biblical standards. This is, my parents are alive because God exists. Maybe I need to explore this. Another example, interesting, uh, my friend Amir Tibon. Now, Amir is a leftist, he's a progressive, he, he, he's a nice guy. But we don't agree on a lot, but he's uh, one of the top journalists for the top left-wing newspaper, Haaretz. Now, he got interested in me because I keep getting invited to meet with top Arab Muslim leaders, kings and crown princes all throughout the region, as, as Jim alluded to. And he's like, what is it? Why is a Jewish believer in Jesus, an Israeli dual American citizen, what is he doing in the palace of the Saudis when the Saudis have not invited any Christian leader into their palace as a family in 300 years? Who is Joel Rosenberg and why is he there? No other Israeli has ever met with the leadership at that level except the prime minister, secretly, no photos. This is how I got to know Amir. Well, Amir and his wife and their two little daughters, I think four and two, live in the closest house, in the closest community to Gaza. Because they believe in peace. They, they want a two-state solution. They're convinced that this is going to work. And then came October 7th. The sirens go off. The rockets are flying faster than more rockets than they'd ever heard in their lives. They, they, everybody has a bomb shelter in their house, I mentioned. They, they, but everybody along those borders, that's where their children sleep because there's no time to go get them from one room and bring them into a bomb shelter. So they rush into the bomb shelter, they close the door, but what's happening? They start hearing machine gun fire. Then they hear Arabic. Amir speaks Arabic. He can hear tactical commands of terror saying, go kill everybody in that house. You guys, go over and kill everybody in that house. I'll take care of this house. Now, bomb shelters don't have locks. There's no way to lock your door on the inside because they're not built to keep genocidal terrorists out. They're, they're built to protect you from missile fire. So they turn off the lights 
And now the, then soon the power gets cut. They've got no air conditioning. They're in there for 10 hours trying to keep their daughters quiet while every, all their neighbors are being murdered. They're shooting into the house. They have a dog. It didn't bark. They thought he was dead. 10 hours. Now they're texting his father. He's texting his father. His father is a retired IDF general, one of the most celebrated generals in modern Israeli history. But he's retired, and he's in his mid-60s. They live in Tel Aviv. So the father says, I'm coming to get you. Just stay quiet. He grabs his 9 millimeter, one extra clip, magazine, says to his wife, get the Jeep. We're going to rescue the kids and the grandkids. But when they, as they're inbound, they find a, a terror-stricken couple who's just come from a music festival where more than 340 Israelis were murdered at point blank. They're running across the field and they're suddenly standing in the road and he slam, she slams on the brakes. And they're like, can you get us to safety? They're 10 minutes from their kid's house. Yes, we can do that. Get in the car. They take them to north. They get them to a safe place. They turn around. They come back. Now they come across a firefight. 18, 19-year-old Israeli soldiers are fighting they're in an intense firefight with Hamas terrorists. So the father says, stay here and stay down. He jumps out with his 9 millimeter. He starts shooting, but then he comes across an Israeli fallen soldier. He grabs his M4, and these terrified but courageous 18 and 19 year old soldiers fighting hardened, demon-possessed terrorists, and this general leads them into battle, and they kill all the terrorists, and then they have to take the wounded up to a hospital. They're five minutes from their house, the kid's house, or they can't get there. They, but they put the wounded in the car, and they drive them north. And the, he says, honey, just take them the rest of the way. I'm, i got to go back. She says, well, how, well, you don't have a car. He goes, I'll figure it out. He's standing there. He doesn't believe in God. They're not believers. Suddenly, a car comes up. It's an old army buddy. A general, just as old as him, only armed with a 9 millimeter. He's like, hey, I'm going to Ophakim to shoot, uh, to, or the uh, Nahalos to kill terrorists. Can you help rescue my kids? You want to help me? Sure. They get there. There's an army battalion or an army division, whatever, platoon of Israeli soldiers at the gates, but th their commander is dead, and they don't know what to do. So these two generals tell them what to do. We're going to go house by house, and we're going to clear them. This is how you do it. They don't know how to do it. And then they eventually get to the kid's house. They're pounding on the steel window that's just blocking, protecting them. And the children go, it's, it's Saba, it's Saba. It's grandfather, he's here to rescue us. 60 Minutes did a, a story on them, 14 minutes long. President Biden was so intrigued with their story that Amir and his father were invited to meet President Biden, when he came into the country uh, a few months ago, I asked, I said, Amir, can I interview for an hour? I want to do an hour special. Absolutely. And he says, I want to thank God. I believe we experienced a miracle. It's an amazing story. I encourage you to Google it. But this is, these are examples of, look, I, I can't come and tell you, oh, they all believe in Jesus now. No, I'm, what I'm saying is they're going from they don't believe in God either at all, or it's not a part of their lives, to after October 7th, maybe there is a God. He miraculously rescued my parents, my family, whatever. It's an amazing story. Let me give you a few other examples. There's a German evangelical family who moved to Israel 40 years ago or so. Why? Because they were Christians, and they were horrified what their country had done to the Jews in the Holocaust. All across. So they said, let's move there and just serve, just help, just be a witness for Jesus. Yeah, we want people to come to know Jesus, but let's just actually serve, serve these people because our, our people were so horrible to them. Well, now they've raised their kids there. Every single one of their kids is serving the army right now. But one of them, their son Uriah, was killed in combat fighting Hamas. This became a huge news story in Israel when the Israeli media discovered, I'm sorry, wait, what? These people are not Jewish? They're Germans, they believe in Jesus, and they are laying their lives on the line 
to defend us? Who are these people? Huge story. And I had the opportunity at an Israeli government-sponsored event that they asked me to moderate to interview the, and talk to the father and, and let him share on a live stream across Israel and across the world. Why? Why is your love for Yeshua, Jesus, motivating you? Why did it, how did it motivate Uriah? It's an amazing story. Here's another one. So the Joshua Fund you know, raises, invests you know, money into strengthening the local church, doing humanitarian relief. Um, so not just as a reporter, but as people who know these, you know, we've been involved for 18 years of doing this, and we've been traveling all across the country. And uh, Lynn had gone up to the north to, uh, uh, with part of the Joshua Fund team to, uh, to help this, this pastor in the furthest most congregation in the north. His name is Israel Illuz, his wife, Marty. Uh, long story short, um, there, are, there are no other believers up that far north. There's no other congregations. Well, they live in Kiryat Shmona. Kiryat Shmona is the largest Israeli city right on the northern border of Lebanon. 23,000 people, all evacuated, okay? But he and his wife wouldn't leave. And they decided we're going to keep, we're going to serve our people up here. And now it's just soldiers up there. So we, so Lynn had been up there to, to, to hear what's happening and pray for them, encourage them, deliver food. So she said, you have to go up there. You, our, we already know Israel, but you just have to see this, Joel, for yourself. And do a story on it. This is an amazing story. I said, okay. So I came up, I brought a, a, a TBN film crew for Rosenberg Report and reporting for all Israel news. And we would go up there. Now, what happens? One of their sons has been fighting in Gaza for three and a half months at that point, And they'd barely seen him. Another one of their sons is diabetic and therefore is medically disqualified from being in the army. We're deeply discouraged. You know, Israeli young people want to be drafted. They want to serve, because, and especially now. And when you cannot, be, when you cannot serve, with, when all your friends and family are doing it, uh, it's very, very discouraging. And this son was very discouraged. But his dream was to be a chef. So he was working multiple jobs, two jobs at this point, And he decides, you know what? I'm going to open up a restaurant. That I, oh, yeah, I can't serve in the army, but I want to be a chef. So let's open up a restaurant. One month before the war starts, he, open, he, he quits his two jobs, takes all of his savings, rents a facility, starts a restaurant. The war breaks out. The entire city is evacuated. There's no customers. They shut down the restaurant. He's despondent. But his father says, listen, we got a lot of soldiers up here. Um, and they're all eating tuna fish out of cans. There's no hot food. And the rains are coming, and it's getting cold, and they're eating corn and garbanzo beans out of cans. Like, let's, why don't, you're, a, you're an amazing chef. Why don't you start cooking? And we'll start delivering food. He's like, I don't know. I, yeah, all right, all right, fine, I'll do it. Now they're doing four to 500 meals a day. This little tiny congregation, actually all the congregation and the people are gone, right? Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door. There's no people. <laughs> so evangelicals from around the world are hearing about this and thinking, I'll, I'll, make, I'll use my vacation time and my own money to come and cut, chop vegetables and help the chef. The chef is great, he, he's wonderful, and he's got this great mustache. So what they've been doing is they, they make these hot meals and they're amazing. Like I, I was joking with them that we're going to come more often, and probably not for the right reasons. Like, you know, I don't really need more of this food, but, but I'm coming just for the food. Yeah, yeah, we'll help too. No, I was teasing. But, but, um, but what they do is on the, on the top of the container, uh, all the volunteers like to do little caricatures of the chef with the mustache. Okay, it's become a little brand. I tried to do it, and my wife said that it looks like you put a slug on his face, and so I gave up on that portion of the program. That's not my spiritual gifting, apparently. So... But this is an amazing ministry, but then you can't deliver anymore because it, the, the missiles are coming, the fighting is so intense now that, they, that there's too many roadblocks. You can't get the food to the soldiers. But, this, but the soldiers are so excited about the food and so grateful that they send military police units to come and get the food and bring it back to them. But now maybe it's not ready, so they'll just sit in the Messianic congregation. Now Messianic Judaism is almost considered a cult in Israel. It's like, we don't, ooh, these people are weird, you know. We'd rather not believe in God or go into witchcraft or Hinduism or Buddhism, but we're not going to believe in Jesus, that's for darn sure. But now they're sitting in this congregation going, and who are you people? 
Why are you here? Why do you love us? What is going on in this building? And they are listening. They are talking about God, about the Bible, about Yeshua. And this is just one example of dozens of congregations that we are talking to the pastors and ministry leaders and they're saying, we have never seen the openness of the Israeli people to having the conversation at least as we're seeing right now. It's extraordinary, they said. We, we just literally never seen anything like that. I'm going to give you one more example because we're already a little bit over time. I know I see you out there, Jim. God bless you. <laughs> I'm going to ignore you just for a second. This story. So this is an important story for you to hear. So this is a couple that I've known as long, you know, since the Joshua Fund existed, probably a little bit before. Dina and Michael. Now, they, Michael is the pastor of the only congregation in the largest city on the southern border of Israel with Gaza. And I knew Dina before they were even married. So I was, you know, that was part of her prayer. Please pray that the Lord sends me somebody who can be a strong biblical pastor and a wonderful husband and father. And the Lord brought Michael. They're both from Ukraine, right? So they've got no place to go back to, but they live on the border and that, that town has been hit by, I mean, I don't even remember how many missiles and rockets over the years. On that morning, she's got video of Hamas terrorists on her street, on their street, going right under their, walking right under their windows. The rockets are coming. Then they start hearing gunfire. Then they start seeing, they hear screams. The, the, the bus stop that's just less than a block from their apartment, everybody's dead. Everybody's dead. Now, that's the bus stop where their own children go to school. to get the, They catch the bus there. But it's a Saturday. Nobody's going to school. But some elderly Israelis who were going to go on a day trip to the beach were just getting on their bus, charter bus, when Hamas killed them all, slaughtered them all without warning. A car was driving along. One of, the, so, uh, one of the terrorists steps out in the street with an RPG, fires a missile right in it. Didn't he, the guy blows up the car, it's all on video. Didn't even see it coming. The grieving, the grieving in this country is off the charts. Michael and Dina and their whole congregation get evacuated. But they're like, okay, we're being evacuated, but we have got to go back. There are shut-ins. There are people that won't leave, can't leave. Maybe they have dogs. Maybe they don't want to be put in an apartment or in a, in a hotel room forever. They, they're like, no, I'd rather die in Starot than be forced to leave my home. I'm not going to leave. Mostly elderly. So they go back every day. And so do their congregation. And they're, and they're cooking food. And they're delivering. And they're delivering groceries that the Josh Fund helps them buy. And they're serving their people. They're showing the love of Jesus. If people want to talk, and they want to talk, they will they will talk about the Lord, the Bible, and Jesus. And that's what's happening. Dina told me the story. And again, you, I encourage you to Google this. This is the digital version on All Israel News. But there's also the, the TV version on, on our YouTube channel. Um, she tells a story that they were so radically saved themselves, they just want everyone to at least hear the good news that the Jewish Messiah has come, and he does save us, and he does change lives, and he, because he rose from the dead. He conquered death, and he brings hope. And they want to tell that, even if people don't want to hear it. Now, they're loving, they're kind, they're not rude, they're not forcing on people. Dina tells me the story on camera. She's speaking in Russian, and, or maybe it was Ukrainian, probably Ukrainian, sorry. Um, and Michael's translating, but, but it's such an interesting story. She was sharing the gospel with a friend of hers, a woman, for three years. This woman finally was like, Tina, I love you. You're a very nice person. I don't want to hear it. Don't talk to me about Jesus. I don't believe. I'm Jewish. It's never going to happen. And she was murdered at that bus stop. But two months before, she came to Dina and said, Dina, I've been studying the Bible. I've been reading these prophecies. I'm listening to everything you're saying. And I can't believe I'm saying it. But I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And would you pray with me? And I want to accept Jesus as my Messiah. Two months later, she was murdered by Hamas. These are people who are heroes. 
You don't know their names. I mean, now you do. Michael and Dina. Uh, these are heroes that we need to pray for. I can't come and tell you thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Israelis and Palestinians are coming to Jesus. Someday, I pray, and we know Romans eleven twenty six says, one day, prophetically, all Israel will be saved. It, that's not today. Maybe it's tomorrow. But right now, we're in the seed planting and seed watering phase. And every Israeli believer that we minister to and, and in our own experience can tell you Israelis have never been more open because Amos 9.9 is true. God is shaking the whole house of Israel. To wrap, we need to keep praying for the 134 hostages to be released. And the, 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 this dog tag that I wear is part of a national Israeli campaign. Dog tags, billboards, it's a big social media campaign. Bring them all home now. That's good. It's to remind the Israeli government, yes, you've got to defeat Hamas, but you've got to prioritize getting the hostages back. Don't surrender for it, but do everything you possibly can to get them back. Good. Amen. We support this. But All Israel News has decided uh, in recent months to launch this hashtag set the captives free campaign. Why? Because if Israel could get the hostages back through negotiations and rescues, it would have been done by now. Today's 170, day 170. And there's still 134 hostages, including uh, little Kafir Bibis, in those tunnels, if they're alive at all. So we need to pray. And the good news is Jesus gives us a prayer. Isaiah gave us a prayer. And Isaiah's prayer is the prophetic prayer that Jesus speaks in Nazareth when the scroll of Isaiah is handed to him. And he reads these exact words as he begins his public ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, no, no, we don't have it, but anyway, this is the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. What does Messiah, Mashiach mean? It means anointed one, right? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to do what? To bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, right? <laughs> Don't we need good news? Don't we need our hearts bro- uh, binded up? Not just Israelis, but Palestinians as well. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Shivuim. The word captives in English is the word shivuim. It's the same exact word that in modern Hebrew we use for hostages. We need to set the captives free. That's what Jesus came to do. To proclaim to, and, and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. This is our prayer. And I hope that you will Google one more thing. Uh, Lynn was part of this. All Israel News brought 150 or so Messianic Jews to the Gaza border to sing a worship song that had been written in the 90s, I think, or in the 80s, actually, in the 80s, based on Isaiah 61, these exact words. And they sing it, and it's so beautiful. And they're, and they're praying that every, yes, that the 134 be released, but that every Palestinian in Gaza will be set free f- from sin, death, and Hamas. That every Israeli would be set free spiritually and physically. Jesus came to set captives free. Yes, spiritual captives, absolutely. But he set demon-possessed people free. He set lame and deaf and blind people free. Now, he doesn't always do it. Sometimes he allows us to go through these infirmities to trust him, to lean on him, because that's part of his sovereign plan. But he's in the business of setting people free. That's what we need to pray. And I hope that all Israel news will be a cat. Oh, there, there it is. Okay, so that's the, that's the scripture. So anyway, the, to wrap up, and I appreciate you. I mean, you could have, you don't really, you're sort of captive yourself. So let me set you free. <laughs> You're like, I'm praying. Is he even listening? So yes, I'm listening. Let's wrap. Look, I want to wrap with uh, one last thought, and that is this. Uh, I'm going to change the name of this young woman. Uh, She's in the late 20s. Uh, She's a friend of Lynn's and mine. Uh, This is not her real name, but I'm going to call her Abigail. Abigail is from Ukraine. Her, Her homeland is being devastated. She's Jewish. She became an Israeli dealing with all kinds of emotional problems, physical problems, 
and pain. And raised in a religious Jewish home meant nothing to her. It was not doing anything for her heart, nothing for her soul. She needed a job, and she ended up getting a job with a Christian organization just because she needed the job. She didn't believe it. She said, don't talk to me about Jesus. I don't want to hear it. But these people were nice to her. They loved her. They welcomed her, and they didn't push her. But she started asking questions. I, I joke that all Jews have large noses, whether we literally have them or figuratively. We're like, what's, what's going on here? What's going on? Why, why are you people so nice? We're not used to people being nice to us. What, 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 what's going on here? So they, she started, like every Israeli, starts asking a ton of questions. And they start pointing her to the scriptures. And I can report that Abigail gave her life to Jesus as the Messiah just a couple months ago. And it even took her about a month till she wanted to tell Lynn and me. But it's real, it's deep, it's, it's, and the people are encouraging her, discipling her. This is happening. I, it, it's not happening. I don't have a lot of stories like that. But we have stories of openness, historic openness, and historic pain. Israelis and Palestinians. So thank you, RBC. Thank you for being our church home. Thank you for your love for everybody in the world. My sister-in-law is in Brazil right now with a lot of your young people. Amen. Preaching the gospel, sharing, being a witness. But thank you for your love for Israelis and Palestinians and others in the region. This is our darkest hour. And only with a global movement of prayer will we be able to see God break the satanic stronghold that is keeping Palestinians and Israelis from the kingdom of God. May you engage in that. I know you've got a lot on your plate, but please, please. And when you get a chance, remember us in prayer as well. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you that even when Satan comes to rob, kill, and destroy, you show mercy. And Israelis and Palestinians are sheep without a shepherd. We've rejected the, the good shepherd. But you're still our shepherd. And when we want to wander around in life without the shepherd protecting us, we're going to face horror. There are savage wolves trying to devour us. Satan is roaming around like a ravenous lion. And, it's, and we have been unwise to abandon our shepherd. But both cultures are being shaken and we pray that you would bring every Palestinian and every Israeli and everyone in the epicenter into your scriptures and into a personal relationship, knowing that Jesus is the chief shepherd. He's the good shepherd, and he's the only shepherd, and he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can get to you, Father, except to the crucified and risen Savior Jesus. Thank you, Lord. May your tribe increase. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you so Amen. much.